So, warning, here comes Whitehead. I told you I'd warm you up first, but now we have to do a little bit of Whitehead. So, let me try. In place of a lifeless, mechanistic nature of atoms and molecules, Whitehead postulates a nature alive. Not nature lifeless, a nature alive. All the way up and all the way down to the smallest and most temporary pulses of energy matter. Those quantum, the bursts of energy matter going on all the time. He calls them actual occasions of experience. We live, he says, in a universe of vibrating matter energy pulses connected in time by memory. So all these pulses. You, heard it, you were dancing last night. You can hear that music. That's a musical pulse, right? But you've got to go all the way down, everything, and all the way up. It's all we have around us. And it's connected in time by memory. I'll come back to that. In place of the Cartesian dualism of mind and body, and remember Descartes says only humans have minds. Everything else is made up of just matter, no minds. Whitehead fuses the physical and the mental in all things, all the way up and all the way down. That is, every actual occasion has a mental and a physical pole, as in a magnet, a north pole and a south pole, a mental pole and a physical pole. The physical pole of an actual occasion inherits and remembers its past and keeps things pretty much the same. So the physical pole keeps things the same, which is good because we don't want too much change. Right? The mental pole of an actual occasion presents, however fleetingly or unlikely, some possibilities for the future, some ch chance for a change, a choice. Wherever there is regularity in the world, we find the regularity of the physical pole. Wherever we find novelty in the world, change, we will find mind, choice, freedom, and improvisational riffing provided by the mental pole. And of course, since we experience both regularity and change nearly everywhere we go, there's a good bet that both mental and physical poles are in operation. So all around us, there's a world that is both stable and changing. It's not just us who get to make choices. The whole universe gets to make choices. What's more, there's a unity, a connectedness between all these things vibrating in the world and across the very small, across the human experience, and across the macro world. We humans seem to experience this unity. We sense, we, we observe the world as a whole. And he wants to try to explain that, but Whitehead goes much further. Every bit of the universe experiences or remembers and participates in this unity. Whitehead calls it mutual imminence. Each actual experience, sorry, each actual occasion of experience is connected to everything else in the universe. He says, we are in the world and the world is in us. This notion is reminiscent of John Muir's observation that when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Some of you may know that line. Whitehead is saying, yes, it is, really, right? So, so Whitehead's a metaphysician. He's saying, this is how the world, this is the world. It's not a metaphor. This is how the world is really made. We humans are aware, at least some of the time, of our mental experiences. We know we make choices. We think about these things. And we use our minds collectively to build social structures, systems, and societies. So here comes Whitehead to talk about how humans have used their mental freedom, their capacity to think, to, to, to help organize themselves. We use our minds collectively to build social structures, systems, and societies. Isms. Whitehead claims that reason and rationality, products of the mental pole, of all things, is utilized in her early humans to promote the art of life, to restrain the tendency toward anarchy, to keep the creative advance flowing. It's a beautiful term of his, the creative advance, always moving, always flowing. And to help get the creative advance unstuck when a worldview is in decay and becomes an obstructive nuisance. I think we would all agree that global capitalism has become an obstructive nuisance. <laughs> it's, it doesn't even get to the point. Capital, nuisance with a capital N, right? Uh, 
So transitions to new fruitfulness, he says, how do we change? He says, we must go back to the utmost depths of intuition for the refreshment of imagination. I'll say that again, <laughs> a little differently. Isms, imaginative systems of meaning, make and remake themselves through creative advances in human experience. And we return over and over again to the deepest levels of intuition that we can navigate in order to refresh our imaginations. Isms are not simply old ideas. They're not relics. They're definitely not fixed and absolute. I think one of the reasons we have so much uh, misery in the world is that we tend to think of these systems as absolute and people fight to keep them that way. They are not. They are dynamic expressions of the imagination. We invent and reinvent and refresh our isms, but only by digging deeply. This, I think, explains Strand Donnelly's ab admonition to keep this kind of thinking front and center in our work. We must constantly go back and be refreshed. Every successful complex society has a coordinating philosophy, and it's important to keep it up, up to date and aware of its assumptions. Car alarm. This explains the efforts of the axial and modern periods, which were transformative for their time. Let's not forget that what Descartes was doing was transformative, that what the axial traditions were doing were transformative. So is the age of ecology, so is Whitehead's efforts. Right? These are all efforts to reimagine the world. Without such a coordinating philosophy, Whitehead warns us that decadence, boredom, and a slackening of effort result. I could imagine Wes Jackson saying those words. <laughs> Decadence, boredom, boredom, and a slackening of effort re result if we don't keep these systems up to date. Finally, the divine presence also, I'm sorry, the divine also has a presence in Whitehead's worldview, though we might not immediately identify with it. Whitehead's God, and I hope you forgive me this way of speaking, Whitehead's God limits the infinite options of a creative universe so that there can actually be a world. He limits the possibility so there can actually be an actual world. God, he says, is the supreme measure of order out of which actuality appears. The religious insight, he says, is the grasp of this truth. And here again is the quote that began this talk with its conclusion, which I left out. The order of the world, the depth of reality of the world, the value of the world in its whole and in its parts, the beauty of the world, the zest of life, the peace of life, and the mastery of evil are all bound together, not accidentally, but by reason of this truth, that the universe exhibits a creativity with infinite freedom and a realm of forms with infinite possibilities but that this creativity and these forms are together impotent to achieve actuality apart from the completed ideal harmony, which is God. So I would not be surprised if it's your heads that are now hurting, right? <laughs> we need some music. Um, but I hope that with this quick uh, overview, you can see the outlines more clearly of a coordinating philosophy at work in our midst that puts wildness in the creative creativity of the ecosphere on full display. This, this creative advance that Whitehead describes is often the result of mergers or syntheses of ideas. Wes has described the synthetic my time here. Wes has described the synthetic mergers in evolutionary biology and agroecology that stand behind his work, the Land Institute's work in natural systems agriculture. I have tried to show here briefly the synthetic mergers that stand behind a perennial philosophy. These mergers are dynamic and ongoing. We can see them at work in the academy with new curricula in earth system science, industrial ecology, biomimicry, ecological economics, and even in medicine and healthcare. All of them seek to understand the world utilizing the ecosystem as a conceptual tool. 
The work being done in understanding bacterial microbiomes, for example, I'm not sure if you've seen them or recent articles in the New Yorker and New York Times, is fascinating and potentially transformative for how we understand and treat diseases across the spectra of life. Right? We're more bacteria than we are our own cells, right? There's more bacteria in us and, and we're covered in it and it really manages who we are. And we're starting to learn that these are ecosystems and that we are an ecosystem. Whitehead's philosophy of organism is an example of what stands behind these efforts, namely an emerging formal understanding of ecosystems and the ecosphere as real entities. So no longer just a conceptual tool, but a real thing. We are well on our way, I think, toward an alternative worldview that has the potential to put us back together again, to heal the ecological and social justice wounds caused by modern global capitalism, to make us less anxious and dependent on a destructive and extractive worldview, to establish standards of morality and justice that protect human dignity and our fellow non-human earthlings, to find grace, beauty, and love in a living universe. It is a worldview with the potential to feed our minds and bodies with food and philosophy that acknowledges nature's wisdom. The perennial imagination is hardwired in each of us. It's in all things across the universe in God. The perennial imagination is us, is nature, is God. There is still much to do, and we wish we could speed things along, but these transitions seem to have a mind or a mental pole of their own. But were such a transition to arrive in its full flowering, changes will come quickly, like a wooden floor giving way after years of hidden decay. Right? It, finally, it gives way all at once. Right? If that transition arrives, and we're working on that transition, that's why we're here today, it will come quickly. Now, I know you're, what you're going to say. We don't have a lot of time. It has to come more quickly, but I think we have to wait. But we're, we're doing it. We're, we're engaged in this act of imagination now, so we can hope. In the meantime, let's continue the examples of good, of good work that we find here at the Land Institute and so many places around the world your home places. Let me give you just a couple of suggestions that you might do after you leave here. Number one, look not just for healthy food to eat, but healthy philosophy to think. <laughs> We're all now expert at reading food labels. Start looking for the coordinating philosophy behind all the green, organic, sustainable alternatives that are presented, presented in pedal to us Pedal to us as alternatives in current ways of thinking. Think of it as concept labeling. <laughs> if you see principles of an extractive an economy and a nature to be subdued or ignored behind these products, remain skeptical. And here's a misfortune of language. We are right to avoid processed foods, but I would encourage you to explore Whitehead's process philosophy. He's actually a very good writer. Number two, if slow food is good, so too should be slow thinking, which is the only speed we can go when reading Whitehead and other deep thinkers. <laughs> and I count Strawn Donnelly among them. These deep thinkers are behind our efforts to reorient the human prospect within a sun-powered ecosphere. That is, find a quiet space away from all of your favorite distractions and engage some of this work. And three, find ways to keep the wild and improvisational channels open in your lives. And I'll let each of you imagine how best to do that. A diet of perennial food and philosophy will make a difference. I, it already has. Just look at the progress being made here, this place and other places around the world. Should it reach a full flowering as a coordinating worldview, a perennial ism, it has the potential to foster happiness, beauty, justice, prosperity, and love to be shared with the whole of nature alive. 
In the meantime, to paraphrase a quote from a well-known character of children's literature, Max, remember Max? He was called Wild Thing by his mother and sent to bed without dinner. So here it is. Let the wild rumpus continue. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste.